we're to do dangerous ideas and both faith and non-faith and fundamentalist faith and extremes of the alternative are dangerous ideas. Um, in a sense, these next, this next hour is sort of a long pop tech, it's pop rel for religion. Um, and I have a very simple dangerous idea. Namely, you are not going to get rid of technology and you're not going to get rid of religion and since we're not going to get rid of either, we better find ways that they can relate to each other perhaps better than they have in the past. You're not going to get rid of religion. Look at the statistics. In 50 years ago, every seventh person in the world was a Muslim. Today, every fifth is. And within two decades, every fourth will be. One third of the world is Christian. And while it's thinning out in the north, Remember the old Sherman William paint ads, they cover the earth, it seems to be seeping down there. Um, there are 3,000 fewer people named Christian in the northern world. I call it the spiritual ice belt. It starts west of Poland and across Western Europe, British Isles, Canada, northern US, and Japan. We don't know what's going on in the rest of the world because it's that different. But we have to perceive that if we want to relate to the rest of that world. Um, it was mentioned that I did five volumes on fundamentalisms around the world. And that's when I really learned, breaking out of the American mold, how little we knew about what was going on out there. The MacArthur Foundation gave a $3 million grant to the American Academy, which is the second oldest such group in America. The biggest grant they had in over 200 years. They could use it for anything as long as it was interdisciplinary, international and had public policy consequences. And they discussed all kinds of things they might. I wasn't there, I didn't know I was going to be doing this, but I heard the report later. They would discuss family structure comparatively around the world, or teenage pregnancy around the world. And this is eight years after the end of the Iranian revolution and the rise of new style fundamentalism in America. And somebody provoked the idea, let's do fundamentalisms. I'm told that uh, one person in the room said, $3 million, that's not a hell of a lot of money for science. Um, one good afternoon of cancer research to take care of that. It's a hell of a lot of money to waste on religion. <laughs> Why? Well, because everything's settled. We have it all figured out. Well, there are several philosophers of science in the room who don't think that. And so I'm told there was quite a debate until finally uh, they said, Dr. X, you're holding out because you think there's only one way to look at the world. You wonder who is the goddamn fundamentalist in this room? You are because they were trying to figure out the ways in which every one of us can examine our presuppositions. And he, I'm told, smiled and voted for it, and they asked me to direct that. We studied them in 23 different religions. Every religion has this hard edge, and we studied them. Some of them very recent inventions. You can picture the problem of the caterer. We had these conferences of 100 scholars, and, and we had, she, had, she had to prepare food that Jews could eat, and Zains could eat, and Sikhs could eat, and Hindus could eat, and Muslims could eat. At the end, she said, I've observed you scholars, you're very fair-minded. You step back serenely and look equally with tolerant benignity on them all. I'm prejudiced. I'm tolerant. I have a favorite. I love you Christians. You'll eat anything. <laughs> well, we learned a lot from that about how, deep, how deeply rooted these things are. And my colleague, Robert Scott Appleby, who now directs the Joan Crock Center for International Studies of Violence, Peace, and Religion, uh, he and I kept tracking these things. For example, on issues and answers, toward the middle of the Iranian hostage crisis, somebody asked the head of the CIA on issues and answers, how could you have missed this thing brewing? How could you have missed all that's going on? And he said, well, uh, see, we, we pay attention to everything that's important in the world. We knew what the women were marrying, we, wearing. We knew what the universities were doing. We knew banking. We knew cinema. We knew international relations. The only thing we paid no attention to at all was religion, because as everybody knows, religion has no power in the modern world. Appleby told me six years later, as he was on the road for all of these things, he said, uh, yeah, uh, six years ago, as I was teaching in a nice little college in Chicago, <laughs> uh, last week I met with Colin Powell, next week I'm speaking at the War College, I often meet with the State Department. I want to tell you one thing, today the State Department has got religion. And it's on every page, every page of, uh, I mean, every issue of every newspaper. So what are we going to do with this kind of thing? 
no, both the growth of religion that won't go away and the hard edge of religion which makes it more militant. I was scheduled to give a lecture at the University of Illinois 914-201 and I chose to call it religion the killer that heals and the healer that kills. Because I think we can make a case that more healing is done in the world in the name of religion through institutions and impulses and heritages and rituals and more killing is done in the name of religion and sometimes by the same people. So we try to figure out what, what is the impulse that this can happen uh, and a lot depends on the moment in history and the place where you are. My last year of teaching at the University of Chicago, the Alumni Association sent me out on the road uh, several times with Marvin Zonas. Many of you would know him, econom uh, International Economics. And uh, he would do his stick, I'd do mine. And his would start something like this. This is right after the fall of the wall and uh, the Iron Curtain. I've got good news and I've got bad news. The good news is the market has won. The market has simply won. The Soviet Union imploded. Nobody believes in communism anymore. They may have power, but they don't believe in it at all. Oh, there's still Cuba and there's North Korea. They believe in it, but it's for power too. China calls itself that, but they're capitalists. They're, the market has simply won. The market has won. And of course, if you're a University of Chicago economist, as he was, you say that often enough and you get the Nobel Prize for economics. <laughs> we, got, we, we got a string from Friedman to Stiegler to Schultz to all the way down. And then he say, and the bad news is that the suddenness of that change has left us, he was saying more in the West than anywhere else, but now we would say globally, it has left us in a spot where we haven't the faintest idea with what political, cultural, social, religious, and other heritage, artistic heritages were going to greet this change. And I think many people were beginning to deal with that when 9-11 came along, when everybody got their backs back up and, and disappeared from the scene. So it's kind of an interrupted thing that we have to get back to now to see where it's going to go. How do we envision these various futures and how the two will relate? In the 1960s, ending around 1970, the American Academy had a project on the year 2000. Uh, I was on the Commission on Values in the year 2000. We disbanded almost instantly because we had the faintest idea what values were in 1968 to project. But uh, Herman Kahn, uh, Kahn and Wiener, uh, did come out with a beautiful book with a lot of good sense in it called The Year 2000. A few things are missing. In the index, you won't see the word oil, for example. But uh, mostly, it really was very fine envisioning. And then there's one section which they said was key up front. And up front it said, we are offering a long-term, surprise-free, multifold trend in which in the future we will be a, first of all they call it a sensate culture, secular culture, characterized by hedonism, pragmatism, um, progressivism, uh, constructive thought, uh, empiricism, they went on and on with all of the sisms. And, uh, A couple of years later, there was a conference in the Vatican. It happened that Pope John XXIII would often talk in sort of concentric circles. God imparted truth to the Catholic Church and wants it to work out to meet the world. And then second came in the uh, separated brothers and sisters. It was a radical notion in 1962, uh, the Protestants and the Orthodox. And then spiritually, we're all Semites. We have to be friendly to the Jews, as he was. And Islam also has Mariam and the prophets and so on. And uh, there's also light in, in, in Hinduism and Buddhism. Really a radical change that became voted in in the council. And then he said, and then there are those men and women who have no faith but do great good in the world. And after he died, his poor successor now had to define who these were. So there was a commission called Non Credendi, a commission on non-believers. And wouldn't you know that uh, communists, atheists, and Protestants were um, invited to discuss non-faith. We had a big conference at the Vatican, w which the Pope himself chaired one day because the newspapers were saying the conference was de ateismo. It was on atheism and people were worried about what's happening to the Vatican. So he gave his endorsement by being there. And the translators were Russian and French and German and English and well, about six of them. And by now you know the pace of my speaking, 
I said, the long-term, surprise-free, multifold trend is that the future of the world will be secularistic, um, sensate, uh, empiricistic, hedonistic, pragmatic, programmatic, and the like. That night, they said, Marty, you're buying the wine, because they all came out of their booths panting to try to translate this into all the languages, except the German, who said it was very easy, I just changed all your ix to ish. Uh, <laughs> Empirish, pragmatic, etc. Well, I tell that story that way so I can anchor in there. Now, I don't want to portray Kahn and Wiener as stupid. We don't, we don't know future. It's not, it did. It sounded like that's what I'm setting up for. No, they said, while that's what looks like the long-term surprise-free multifold trend, the culture of which it's a part is unstable, and we have to report that all the great philosophers of history of the past century, no matter where they were, India, um, Europe, wherever, they all envisioned that as that broke up, you could look to what they called a neo-religious stage, and they said, we're not writing this for your comfort. It can be new nationalisms, it can be religions of science, or religion and science. More likely, it would be the old religions revived in a new kind of way. And I think we're in that now, in that both of these forces are very strong. Science, tech, keeps moving on, as does religion. So now you have forces that meet each other, and uh, how do they meet? Well, I keep track of these things. I'm equally interested in both. My field of study is that. And I pick up evidences wherever I can. And on the way from Chicago to Fort Wayne, Indiana, to visit some relatives, I stopped, as you do at all the rest stops along the superhighways, there's, a, there's what in religion we call a tract rack. They put a lot of tracts there on all the attractions. There are plenty of them here in Maine. Um, Saturday night in Mishawaka, eight things to do. Or uh, have a wonderful weekend in Kokomo. Uh, really exciting things. And, and then there's one, Amish Acres. Who is more remote from technology in the world than the Amish? And they invite you. I've been there. I invite you. And if you go, you'll really like it. You will eat well. You'll sleep well. You'll have peace of mind. It really is wonderful. But they have to lure you there. So they say, well, now, one of the big things about us is we keep the technological world at a distance. So leave your cell phones at home. We have no phones on the property. If you really want to know peace, there's no ra radio, there's no television. Maybe you're a little put out when you left the expressway to come to us because you're behind a buggy instead of a car. You have to understand we're a 200 plus year old uh, religious group that tries to keep its distance from the world of modernity and all that. And if you'd like to know more about it, it's www.amishakers. <laughs> and you could look it up. I mean that, Amish, www.amishakers. I also, I also collect the ways the two worlds come together. I spoke once in a church in Dallas. Uh, when people want to meet fundamentalists, I would never take them to Orthodox Jews or Amish or anything like that. I'd take them to downtown Dallas. And I spoke in a church there. I didn't preach because I'm not of the tribe. <laughs> but, but I spoke between the services. I went, the pulpit was like a 747 panel. Technology. I could say there's a baby crying in nursery 23B. A jaguar left its lights on in parking lot 4A. I could change the temperature. I could change the weather and all that. <laughs> Power. Um, and, but I did stay for the 11 o'clock service, and the minister preached against technology. <laughs> now, think it through. All of these fundamentalisms were born in a technological era. We didn't study historic religions. Every religion has a conservative side, a moderate side, a liberal side. Our assignment was to deal with modern religious fundamentalism. And the more we studied them comparatively, put them all in line, what first struck us was they were all born in the 1920s. The word fundamentalism was invented in a Baptist magazine in July 1920. You won't find it in any dictionaries. You could have the word adjective fundamental, but fundamentalism, because somebody said the modern world is hitting us, and everybody in our denomination calls themselves conservative, but they won't fight back. We need a new name. We're going to stick for the fundamentals. We'll fight back. And in the 1920s, that's what began to happen. Everyone in this room certainly knows by 1925 the Scopes trial because it focused so much on their reaction to uh, Darwinian uh, uh, visions, uh, became prominent. Meanwhile, in India, two parties, one of them got unseated not so long ago for shorthand RSR and 
BJP, RSS and BJP were forming on subcontinental religious grounds that had always been gentle. Our image of Hinduism is it's very open and gentle, and they got their back up. The Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt formed in 1928, same year I was. And uh, it, it was very young and new and modern. And Sayyid Qutub is killed, and it moves up with Wahhabis up into Saudi Arabia. It has its new home there. All made possible in part by the fact you could connect people. Before that, if you're a Baptist on one side of the hill in Tennessee, you never even meet the others on the other side of the hill. But now you can have these little radio stations in Del Rio, Texas, and say, if you believe this, join. And they've done that very well. Interestingly to us, in the 1950s was the second round. Now we were really aware of the global side and television. I don't think you'll hardly ever see Reformed Judaism on television, moderate Catholicism down the street, uh, liberal or moderate Protestantism, they may have their half an hour a week or something like that, but most of what you're watching is hardline movements. They really knew how. And in the midst of all that, in the next period, think of this. The Ayatollah Khomeini revolution starts with humble little micro things sent from Paris, where he's in exile, to Iran and they're playing them, and he's getting all these new kinds of things. We studied how it happened in Iran, and modernity was the big instigator. I spoke at a commencement at the University of Southern California not long before the Iranian Revolution. There were 1,200 Iranian um, graduates in the class. Nine out of 10 of them never became fundamentalist. Many of them were semi-secular. But some of them came back in these movements. But in any case, what they did, they brought technology into villages where those who weren't of their social class didn't get any benefits of it, so they started losing what they did have. And along the way, as uh, Ernest Gellner, one of our philosophers, said, in Iran, the revolution came about not from young women, not because mother wore the uh, veil, because mother didn't wear the veil. Grandma did and the tradition was interrupted. So when the tradition is interrupted, they came along to that kind of thing. I would say that what we have to be doing in the time ahead, remembering that most people who use technology are not religious militants, and most religious people are not militants who use technology, what we have to do, I think, is find the ways to isolate the hard-edged things. That's hard to do with modern media communications, again, because as we've noticed in all these things, nobody ever paid any attention to any of these religions until they killed somebody. And then they never backed up into the understandings of family life, of identity in this morning's term, of ego, of the tribe, on whom you depend, or so on. And I think that we're now moving to that. And when I began, as I'm now going to end, by saying religion isn't going to go away, I think what we are perceiving is uh, profound human needs that will find outlets in all kinds of ways. Our term this afternoon is faith. You can have faith in so many kinds of things. I doubt whether I've used the word God yet today. Um, that's probably the majority of religious people do that. But look around you in the culture or in this room. All kinds of ways, and I think two things that drive this. On the one hand, uh, the sense of mystery. A mystery doesn't mean ignorance. When you invoke mystery, you're not saying, I'm so stupid that I'll call everything mystery. Mystery is something you confront and you're a part of, and the deeper you go, the more is there, and you can welcome all the science you want, but you haven't gotten the basics. I'll tell a story of a, a freshman signs up for a, a physics course and a philosophy, joint course. He said, I'm finally getting a chance to bring the two together, because I have the question, what is it? Why is there something and not nothing? Said, well, you know, that's been asked for a few thousand years, and no philosopher has come close to answering it, no theologian. And he kept complaining. You know, this is a high tuition school. I'm paying high tuition, he complained. And, and I'm not going to get an answer. And he went on and on until the prof finally said, listen, even if there were nothing, you'd be complaining. <laughs> so so I'm, the mystery is there, and we will handle it in different ways. And for most people, as science comes along, they wrap it up in a new way. Uh, because of a search, the other word, is a search for meaning. We're in a world of the random and the contingent and so on, and we find ourselves in a company of people who provide symbols and comfort and help and hope and impel us into the world. So, simple thesis, 
whenever I had a doctoral student, I would say, you have to, before I'll take on your thesis, you have to say, the thesis of my thesis is, <laughs> the thesis of my thesis this afternoon is, technology and religion are not going to go away. We're going to have to find far more inventive ways than we did in the past to find the meat for the sake of human good. Thank you.